Hello everyone, welcome back to another session on dentistry and more. So in oral pathology so far we finished uh, important syndromes and important tumors. Now we are moving on to important cysts. So uh, we have uh, radicular cyst uh, or endogenic keratocyst and uh, denticular cyst. And these three are the most important uh, ones uh, for university exam. So let's uh, get into the details of radicular cyst. So cyst is a pathological fluid filled cavity lined by an epithelium. So cyst is always a well circumscribed lesion which has a clear boundaries that is a epithelial lining will be there so it has three components basically lumen wall and epithelial lining this is the lumen innermost which is innermost cavity which is having a fluid and immediate to that lumen there will be lining and the outermost covering is capsule it's also known as wall so these are the three components of cyst now we are moving on to the classification. We have basically two types. One is odontogenic and non-odontogenic. From the name itself, we get the idea. This is tooth related. This is not tooth related. Tissues are the origin, cause of origin. So odontogenic, we have again two types, developmental and inflammatory. Okay, Inflammatory is the cause of inflammation is uh, resulting in cyst. And developmental is default developmental and problems or developmental uh, process uh, resulting in a cyst formation. So in developmental cyst, we have odontogenic keratocyst, dentigerous or follicular cyst, eruption cyst, lateral periodontal cyst, gingival cyst of infants. These are the developmental cysts in oral cavity. In inflammatory cysts, the most common one is radicular cyst, which is having three types, apical, lateral and residual. And another inflammatory cyst is paradental cyst. In non odontogenic we have nasopalatine duct cyst and nasolabial cyst. It's not particularly tooth related. So radicular cyst is, uh, is odontogenic cyst which is derived from cell rest of molasses which proliferates in response to inflammation. So radicular cyst is seen at the root tip so when caries occurs, it is not treated, it goes to the tip of root and it causes inflammation and it is becoming a cyst. That is the idea of radicular cyst. So it is in response to inflammation. So which is also known as apical periodontal cyst, periapical cyst or root end cyst. So we have three basic types of radicular cyst apical lateral and residual apical and lateral is based on the relative position of cyst with respect to the root this is at the tip which is circumscribing the tip exactly lateral cyst is not circumscribing the tip or apical foramen which is uh, more of a lateral side of a root residual cyst actually there is no tooth which is uh, originating from a residues of or uh, remnants of a tooth and the most common location of radicular cyst is maxillary anterior region then maxillary posterior then mandibular posterior and mandibular anterior most common is maxillary anterior and least common is mandibular anterior so that is a uh, radicular cyst cl basic uh, cyst classification and uh, location about uh, radicular cyst so moving on to the epidemiology of radicular cyst, it is uh, one of the most common cyst of jaw that is 60 to 70 percentage of cyst are radicular or periapical cyst and it is most commonly seen between 20 to 60 years and it is very rare less than 10 years. Maxilla is more affected as, because uh, Porosity of maxillary bone is more favorable for cystic formation 
compared to the mandibular one, 3 is to 1 ratio, that is 3 times more lesions are found in maxilla and it is a male predilection cyst with 3 is to 2 ratio compared to the females. In clinical features, it is asymptomatic and slowly progressive but if infection enters, the swelling becomes painful and rapidly expanding. Otherwise, it is asymptomatic and a slowly progressive one. The initial swelling is round and hard, but later what happens is the part of wall is resorbed, leaving a soft, fluctuant swelling and bluish in color. So initial it is very round and a hard structure but as the lesion expands the part of wall is resorbed leaving a soft flexion swelling. So when bone has been reduced to eggshell cracking, a, a crackling sensation may be felt on pressure. So it will be reduced to eggshell cracking there will be a crackling sensation when applying pressure. So this is a uh, important uh, sequence of events how the radicular or periapical cyst is formed. So it starts with the cause that is either caries, trauma, pulpal necrosis or periodontal disease and it leads to periapical inflammation. So once the inflammation starts it slowly develops and becoming periapical granuloma. That is granulation tissue, scar or inflammatory cells will be there which provide rich vascular area to rest of molasses and rest of molasses proliferate which is forming a large mass of cell. Then what happens? Then the inner cells of this mass deprived of nourishment. So, the inner cell will be deprived of nourishment which undergo liquefaction necrosis, formation of a cavity in the center of granuloma and ultimately a result with a proper epithelial lined cavity which is radicular or periapical cyst. Cyst wall separates from bone due to the pulpal irritation. So how it starts? It starts with caries, trauma, necrosis or periodontal disease that is a cause, inflammation, periapical granuloma, then cell rest of molasses, it proliferates, it becoming a large mass, then inner mass deprived of nourishment, it undergo liquefaction necrosis and formation of a cavity. So that is a pathogenesis of radicular cyst. So how do we diagnose radicular cyst? We can use a combination of radiographs and vitality test. We can do a vitality test mostly. It will be a non-vital tooth and radiographic appearance is a most conclusive evidence. We will easily understand uh, a periapical cyst from a radiograph. So in clinical findings, the signs and symptoms. The smaller cyst uh, do not usually become acutely infected but the larger cyst there will be expansion of bone, displacement of uh, tooth root and crepitus on palpation of alveolar bone and negative responses will be there on pulp testing and the regional lymph nodes will be affected. Moving on to the radiographic features, it is uh, most commonly identical to periapical granuloma. There will be a radio opaque line around the periphery of radiolucent area. So this cyst will be a radiolucent uh, area but that will be uh, covered or surrounded by a radio opaque line. So mostly it will be a ovoid or round radiolucency with a radio opaque line at the borders. Mostly it will be less than 1.5 cm diameter and it will be a well circumscribed lesion. So the differential diagnosis can be periapical granuloma or endogenic tumors and giant cell lesions. So treatment options are most commonly we should do root canal filling. Then extraction is also uh, needed in few cases. Extraction of uh, non-vital tooth and curettage of the apical zone if it is very much infected. 
root canal filling with uh, episectomy and if it is not properly done there is chance for residual cyst so uh, severe condition we need to go for enucleation or marsupialization so that's all about radicular cyst it is the most uh, common cyst one of the common cyst uh, and cyst and tumors are different so it is the first cyst in our uh, segment the next one is dentigerous cyst and uh, odontogenic uh, keratocyst also coming up so i'll come up with uh, dentigerous cyst in my next session thank you Hello everyone, welcome back to a new session on dentistry and more. Today's topic is denticular cyst. So last class we had seen radicular cyst or periapical cyst. The second most common cyst after the radicular cyst is denticular cyst. So let's see the details of denticular cyst. Dentigerous cyst, the name itself gives an idea about uh, its origin, that is dentigerous, gerous means a germinal, so dental tooth forming cells associated with a cyst is known as dentigerous cyst, exactly the enamel epithelium, we know reduced enamel epithelium which is the outermost covering when the tooth erupts into the oral cavity. So some malformation or some uh, improper reaction happening with the reduced enamel epithelium creating a cyst which is known as dentigerous cyst which is the second most common cyst after radicular or periapical cyst that is the odontogenic cyst it is also known as follicular cyst because it's, it creates a follicles uh, follicle above the tooth crown so it is also known as a follicular cyst so usually these type of patients comes to the clinic with a swelling and an unerupted tooth so there is a swelling associated with unerupted tooth so you uh, might uh, keep a differential diagnosis of denticular cyst so that is a common symptom associated with this so we'll begin with there is a enclosure of part or all of the unerupted tooth in denticular cyst so a part or whole of the tooth just like this this is a whole of the tooth or part of tooth is enclosed by the cyst so there is fluid accumulation between the reduced enamel epithelium and the enamel surface of unerupted or impacted tooth so tooth is there so as the tooth erupts into the oral cavity this reduced enamel epithelium supposed to move away but what happens is there is some reaction happening fluid is getting accumulated between this tooth crown that is enamel and the reduced enamel epithelium and creating a cyst that is a fluid accumulation so it is basically from dental follicle moving on to the clinical features it is most commonly seen between first second and third decade there is no gender predilection it is commonly seen equally uh, distributed males and female are equally affected but it is most commonly mandibular areas are affected compared to maxilla 70% cases are reported in mandible compared to the maxilla where it is 30%. So the mandible, it is most commonly the ankle of mandible, then canine regions. So maxillary and mandibular canine regions are affected. After that, maxillary third molar area. So uh, the most common site is ankle of mandible and least common site is maxillary third molar area. It is usually a painless uh, condition or a painless cyst but it become painful when there is a secondary infection and it is a aggressive lesion it uh, grows in an aggressive nature there will be bone expansion and facial asymmetry because it is affecting uh, mostly the mandibular posterior region tooth remain unerupted that is the thing because it is uh, the cyst is over the tooth crown connecting the cemento enamel junctions or a part of tooth so tooth will be most of the time unerupted so how this happening pathogenesis so first there will be cystic changes in the remnants of enamel organ so 
it encloses the crown of an unerupted tooth which is attached to cemento enamel junction so what happens there is expansion of follicle when fluid collects or the space is created between the reduced enamel epithelium surrounding a developing tooth which degenerates so when erupting tooth compress the tooth follicle which obstruct venous outflow which induces serum to cross through the capillary walls and that is just the uh, process which is happening so it's a very simple process tooth erupts into the oral cavity so when a tooth erupts this reduced enamel epithelium should move away and the tooth erupts but what happens here here the tooth uh, with reduced enamel epithelium is not moving away there is collection of fluid is happening between this reduced enamel epithelium and the developing tooth so there will be expansion of this follicle and fluid will be collected between this space and later cystic changes happening and it becomes a proper cyst in radiographic features it will be just like any cyst a well defined radiolucent area it can be uni or multilocular uh, it covers entire crown of unerupted tooth and in radiographic way it expands three direction one is it can be circumferential or lateral or coronal so these three types of growth can happen or it can be seen in radiographic feature it is not easy to um, see these three ways of expansion in a clinical uh, setup so we need to make this uh, more clearer by using a radiograph in histologic features there is a cystic lining which is composed of reduced enamel epithelium and there will be occasional keratinization by metaplasia and inflammatory cells chronic inflammatory cells will be there if it is infected so that is about histologic features and we can do investigation uh, using a uh, opg and ct scan iopa can be taken and uh, biopsy should be uh, taken to get a clear picture about this denticular cyst and treatment options we have enucleation masopialization or a combination of enucleation and masopialization and also a curettage associated with enucleation also can be performed in denticular cyst treatment modality so that's all about denticular or follicular cyst so let's uh, see the okay see that is odontogenic keratocyst in next session thank you hello everyone welcome back to a new session on dentistry and more today we have odontogenic keratocyst or okc to learn so we covered uh, radicular cyst and denticular cyst in our last sessions so the third one is odontogenic keratocyst it is a benign uh, which is not very uh, common one and which is a locally aggressive type of cyst now let's get into the details of okc as the name suggests it is a tooth uh, related cyst and which has a keratin deposition that's why it's got odontogenic keratocyst it's originated from dental lamina remnants in mandible and maxilla or it could be a extension of basal cells of overlying epithelium so either dental lamina it forms from dental lamina or from the basal cell of overlying epithelium moving on to the histopathology the epithelium lining is uniformly thin maybe 8 to 10 cell layers the basal layer is palisaded nuclei is polarized and intensely stained luminal cells has parakeratinized and corrugated profile and there will be micro cyst formation so uniform epithelial lining palisaded basal layer polarized and highly stained nuclei parakeratinized and corrugated 
luminal epithelial cells and microcyst formation in clinical features uh, it commonly seen in second to third decade or it can affect to any age group especially adults people and uh, mandibular molar area that is a posterior border is most commonly affected well coming to the radiographic features it has smooth oval shape and the cortical border uh, if a cortical border is well defined if not secondarily infected and this radiolucent lesions in some cases there will be multi locular appearances mostly it will be radio lucent lesions some cases there will be uh, the bone septa uh, will be giving a multi locular appearances and there will be keratin uh, presence in the cyst so that is why it is getting uh, keratocyst name so what is the effect on surrounding structures so when it grows along the internal aspect of jaw with minimal expansion but sometimes upper ramus and coronoid process uh, it shows expansion and it displaces and resorb teeth with uh, but the degree of uh, displacement and resorption is not as severe as dentigerous cyst so dentigerous cyst the displacement and resorption of the adjacent is is more compared to the okc inferior alveolar canal may, may be displaced inferiorly because of the compression or the pressure it applies and it occupies the maxillary antrum if it affects the maxilla if the cyst is in the maxillary region it occupies a maxillary antrum region most commonly the differential diagnosis is dentigerous cyst ameloblastoma or odontogenic myxoma treatment can be uh, done using wide surgical excision to avoid recurrence or masopialization also can be applied so odontogenic keratocyst is uh, not very detailed uh, one it is a uh, uh, benign uh, a rare cyst which is uh, locally aggressive seen in the posterior uh, mandibular area most commonly and which has uh, keratin deposits in the cyst so that's all about okc or odontogenic keratocyst i'll come up with a new topic in oral pathology thank you